Oh my God, a different bumper? That's right. Hell yeah, it is. Everybody, this is Brian, and I wanted to let you know that we do not have a video episode this week. You should still go to patreon.com slash late night and sign up over there to get other video episodes and mini episodes and all that stuff. But the thing I really wanted to say before the episode this week is that my smooth jazz album is finally coming out. Mature Situations by Trey Magnifique, produced by the Commander Meowch, comes out on November 10th, and you can pre-order a copy now at Let's Have Sax. Dot com. That's right. I bought the domain Let's Have Sax, S A X, and you can go there and pre order a copy of the album on vinyl or cassette or get a signed headshot, whatever you want. Also, we're doing a release party slash show for the album at the Moroccan Lounge here in Los Angeles on Thursday, November 9th. You can go to the Moroccan Lounge website for tickets. It'll be me and an amazing, amazing act, Bona Vega, who will be opening for me, and also a very, very short but sweet set by the DJ Thanksgiving Brown. And you might know who that is because it's a past guest on the show. Anyway, thank you all for your support over the years and for being patient while we put the finishing touches on this smooth jazz album. I'm really excited about it. And now let's enjoy an advice episode. Tried to make a break for it in my uh, little fucker. Yeah, she is a little fucker. She is a little fucker. She's such a bastard. I love a little fucker. She needed a refill on her prescription low fat dog food, and the vet wouldn't give it to me until I made an appointment with them. What? Yeah. And so the appointment is on Wednesday. And I made this call after running out last week. And so I've been having to make homemade dog food. Oh my God. And she is so happy about it. Like she could not be more <laughs> thrilled with mm -hmm. the disgusting combination that is, you know, edible for humans, but sans seasoning and thus is disgusting, which is white rice, peas, carrots, and ground turkey. <laughs> Let me tell you, ground turkey with no fat, no seasoning. Oof, oof. My grandmother actually used to do a similar thing for our dogs, like pretty much that. And yeah. uh, we'd mix it in with kibble. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, you firsthand know how she is around white rice. So imagine that with a little meat in there. She loves rice. I, it's weird. I've never seen a dog love rice. I know. It's so weird. Like you would think it that for so a dog's weird. favorite food, it would be something like, I don't know, steak. No, yeah, it's white rice. something meaty. Yeah, it's white rice and watermelon. <laughs> I forgot red watermelon. That's right. It's so cute to watch yeah. her eat watermelon. And I have like a renewed love of watermelon in the past couple of years. Oh, it's so good. Oh, Do you put salt on salt. it? Yes, of course I put salt on it. I never even heard about this until there's a kid's book we used to read when Audrey was little called The Watermelon Seed, something like that. And it is mentioned, and I love it with salt. And I was like, who the fuck puts salt on watermelon? Well, lots of people, apparently. Do you not do it? Have you tried it? I have not tried it and I do not do it because Layden, at my age, more salt is not something I want. You don't need that much salt. You just need a little bit. It's, I, I'm telling I you, could, it I is. I could a, try it. It's a considerably different experience when you put salt on it. Like to the point that thinking about it right now, my mouth is like flooding with saliva. You only need a little bit. Uh, first of all, is your mouth okay? <laughs> That's fine. Good. You know what I like that's in that vein is have you ever eaten pretzels while you're eating an apple? I'm sure I have. It fucking rules. Get those like little mini rolled gold ones, like little twists. Yeah. And a nice like tart apple. Oh. oh, that sounds so good. I would have never thought about what a lovely crunchy little combination. Yep. So not even necessarily in your mouth at the same time, but one after the other, you get the sweetness and the tartness from the apple. And mm. the crunch and the salt from the pretzel. Oh, it's so great. And I guess it's the same sort of thing, right? You have a sweet watermelon yeah. with the, yeah, okay. Now it's, the plausibility is increasing for me. Yeah. Do you ever do, you know, a slice of cheese with a slice of apple at the same time? Because I love that shit. 
I'm not a cheese guy. You don't like cheese. God, I always forget that about you. I don't you. like some cheese, and the canonical cheese for apple seems to be American or like cheddar, and I don't like those cheeses. Yeah, it could be cheddar or like a little... There's that... I always forget what it's called. It's like a hard cheese. Gouda? No. It's aged in red wine. Oh, it's like a port cheese, right? Yes. yes. It's so fucking... Yeah, yeah. That with like a really thin slice of apple is amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to get more into cheese. I remember this book, the name of the book is The Man Who Ate Everything. Jeffrey Steingarten, not Steingartner. And I remember reading this a long time ago. And basically, so the guy's like a food writer or a food critic or something like that. And in the beginning of the book, he details how he's like, look, I had some food I hated and I decided to work at not hating it. And now, if I remember correctly, and now he loves all of it. Wow. And he was like, just exposure therapy, essentially. Like, I remember one of the things was kimchi. He's like, I always Mm. hated kimchi. Well, I'm just going to try it, you know, but yet a nation of however many million people love kimchi. Who's wrong here? Not them. (laughs) Yeah. So he's like, and I just kept trying it until I liked it. And I was like, what an amazing strategy. And I did this to myself with blue cheese. So... I used to hate like moldy cheese. Mm -hmm. And then when we were living in England, we saw Stilton was everywhere. I was like, you know what? Let me just try it. And I learned to not love it, but not hate it. I love that you don't like cheese, but you went straight for the most inaccessible cheese. Foot cheese. Yeah. The stinky foot cheese. Yep. Yeah. But it wasn't the really stinky one, but it's like Mm -hmm. stinky-ish, stinky adjacent. I really can't fathom, like, not liking cheese. Cheese is very important to me. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's the thing that frustrates me the most when I, you know, there are a lot of vegan restaurants in LA. I have a lot of respect for vegans and vegetarians because I think they're morally correct and have better self-control than I do. Uh, and I never want to say no when somebody invites me to, you know, get vegan food or whatever. Yeah. But every time I go, I'm just like, <laughs> this fucking sucks. Mm-hmm. This sucks bad. And we have like amazing vegan food here, but especially when it's like, here's the best vegan food and it still tastes like shit. (laughs) But it's, it's the fake cheese, the fake cheese, cheese. Oh, no, no, no. If I go to a shitty restaurant and I get something, it doesn't have to be the best in the world. And then they just like put a lot of cheese on it. Great. I'm happy. But you can't even hide behind that at a vegan place. Because it's like, just give me some fucking roasted vegetables then because this fake cheese is a crime. That's why what I was going to say is Every good vegan meal I've had has not been like traditional American food that just there was a vegan version of. It's like yeah. Asian food, right? It's yeah. some, you know, it's like Indian or Japanese or something like that, where it was kind of naturally vegan to begin with to some extent. Mm-hmm. And that then it's like, fuck yeah. But if you're making vegan pizza, like, okay, I just want to say disclaimer to everyone out there who likes vegan pizza, you're a bad person. <laughs> vegan pizza is bad. Don't eat it. Like, I understand you might be screaming at your podcast app right now. Brian, how dare you? Well, I'm sorry. I have moral guidelines. And vegan pizza is bad. And if you like vegan pizza, you are bad. I, I had like, you know, quote unquote, chicken nuggets. Those I like. It depends. It, oh, yes, it does. They were meant to be like McNugget dupes. And... Uh. Look, I love McNuggets. I'm a little goblin and I love them. Because you're gobbling up those nugs? Yeah, I'm gobbling those nugs up on the reg. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awful. That's great. We, sh- we shouldn't be allowed Let's to do Let's change the title of the podcast to <laughs> gobbling those nuts up on the reg. Nugs? It's G-O-B-L-I-N. That was a Freudian slip on your part, Brian Wicked. I said nugs, did I? You said nuts. I did? Yeah. (laughs) Are you sure? I'm positive. You said nuts. Listeners, back me up. I meant to say nugs. (laughs) Let's change the title of the podcast to Goblin Those Nuts Up on the Reg. You know, I I feel like I might have had a a mistimed glottal stop on that G, but I'm Uh pretty sure. Sure. Look, I believe you. I believe you. Uh, I'm never quite sure what's going on with daddy's tongue. So who knows? Maybe I did say nuts. 
anyway, the the nugs, the vegan nugs tasted like cardboard. It's like McNuggets aren't good chicken nuggets. I'm not eating them because they're good chicken nuggets. Far from it. They're processed. Goo- it's like when they do the Hell's Kitchen or whatever with kids and Gordon Ramsay like shows the kids how McNuggets are made. Then he's like, now who wants to eat them? And they're all like, me. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I just, I don't want an imitation of a thing that's already bad with all of the things that make the bad thing pretty good removed. Yeah. Yes. But speaking of telling people who like vegan pizza that they're bad people, I think that's a good segue into the gimmick for this particular episode of Late Night with Brian Wecht. Gimmick, I guess. (laughs) You can't deny that it's a gimmick. It was a gimmick when we first started doing it, and then we stopped doing it because it was a gimmick. And now we're back. Yeah, we're back, baby. Welcome to another fantastic episode of Late Night with Brian Wecht. My name is Leighton Gray. My last name is not Knight. I might get it legally changed if we ever oh, end up idea. actually making money from this podcast, but we'll that. see. And next to me, digitally, is Brian Wecht. Uh, what up, Juice Crew? That's what I say. <laughs> That's my intro every week. What up, Juice Crew? <sighs> okay. Well, early on in this show, we would do advice episodes. We would give early advice. On. Yes. Early. I'm talking single digit episodes. Mm-hmm. And thank you, anybody who wrote in when we were still in the single digits. But we thought that it might be nice to return to that and give it a shot now that we have more podcasting experience under our belt and mm-hmm. maybe like five more listeners than we did at mm-hmm. the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we asked the good folks of the internet to email us with some advice questions. And today we're going to be giving advice. Hell yeah, we are. I'm How do you feel it. about giving advice, Brian? Well, uh, I, I'm of two minds. One is why would anyone ever listen to me about anything? And the other is it's fun to give people advice on their lives, knowing that you're kind of an outside observer and also how to say this? It's low stakes for us personally, right? Oh, like, yeah. This is what, also why I'm a little ambivalent about it because it's like anyone can be like, yeah, dump them. And you're like, well, okay, easier said than done. Right. But of course, it's fun. My favorite thing is I love giving advice for stuff that I need advice on yes. and refuse to listen to. So mm-hmm. I'm going to very excitedly be doling out some sage advice that I am physically unable to follow because of my own. Sure. But that's where all good advice is. I do read occasional advice columns. You know, I think they're interesting. You know, it's a game that you can always play, which is, is this fake? Uh, Is this letter writer making it up? Which, well, I fully believe 90% of them are fake, (laughs) but I'm a long time reader of the, constellation of advice subs on reddit our relationships our underscore relationship advice r slash two hot takes r slash am i the asshole regular Mm -hmm. rotation they are truly hubs for creative writing exercises and it's kind of like really baffling how you see people on mass get taken in by clear bait posts. Because oh anybody who oh writes a bait God. post, there's always one line where it's like, oh, you got too cute. You got too yep. cute. This yep. is yep. this yep. was yep. your like bridge too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My favorite advice column, newsletter, whatever it is now, which I don't actually subscribe to anymore, but I do see occasionally, is Heather Haverleski's Ask Polly. I love Heather Haverleski. I think she is the perfect amount of kind and no bullshit and a little bit nihilistic. She's amazing. She's a super smart, interesting person, great writer. I popped one of her books, a collection of essays a while back called Mm. What If This Were Enough? I think that's the title. But she writes a really great advice column and has for many years. Wow. Yeah. I also think it's funny when some of the older ones like Miss Manners or whatever, you know, give advice because I'm like, what? what? Who? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I feel like we should do a disclaimer up front. Despite us telling you what to do, do not listen to our advice. We no. cannot be held legally liable for any advice that you may or may not follow. Yeah. We are not professionals. We're not in your life. We don't see what you're seeing. If we say something stupid, we own it. We don't know what we're talking about. 
Use your discretion. Thanks for emailing. Okay. Great. Well, how do we do this? Should we just go from the bottom up with the ones you starred? Uh, or what? Or give me a subject line, actually. Well, well great they're news. All they're all the same subject <laughs> line, which is, <laughs> which is our fuck up. Actually, no, this one has a different subject line that says, help, I need advice for pre- free, please. Ah, got it. Yes, good. Would you like to read it? Absolutely. Hello, Mr. Tonight. I am 24 years old and am of the generation that absolutely despises doing phone calls. Nothing worse than having to do a phone call except for maybe when you get a phone call out of nowhere, double question mark. Frankly, I find it completely terrifying that at any point during the day, someone can just interrupt my life and invade my home by calling my phone. Now, of course, I can choose not to pick up, but what if it's my parents? Yes, that's right. My parents refuse to communicate by texting. Even if I send them a question in a text, they will call me to reply. And if I don't answer the phone, they won't leave a text explaining why they called. It could be serious or it could be small talk. They call me every day, every day. How do I politely tell them not to call so often or at all? Thank you. Well, well now. This is a very relatable issue as a Zoomer. Yeah, I mean, my advice, number one is... You can't change other people. And if you've made the request for them to text, not call you, and they're still not doing it, that's not going to happen. I mean, you could similarly refuse to communicate when they call you. Never pick up the phone. I think they might then change their tactic, but that's a dangerous game to play. Does it indicate in this email that this person has talked to their parents about it already? I don't think That's it does. a good point. It, it 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 doesn't. And now we we find the fatal flaw of all advice shows, which is that we never quite have enough background to really give it. But does it say here my parents refuse to communicate by texting? That to me indicates that there was some degree of communication there. See, for me, I read that as they just you know are are very much not actually texting. Yeah. I want to approach it as if you have not talked to your parents okay, about this. Let's do that. Let's do that. So I also hate talking on the phone. I hate getting a phone call more than anything else on this earth, especially because most of them are spam calls that I don't want to pick up. Well, that's certainly part of it. And then if I get a real phone call, I don't want to talk to people on a whim. This is the true Zoomer perspective of I just hate it so much. And I think that you're going to have to bite the bullet and do a phone call here. And on that phone call, you should express to your parents that it really doesn't work for you and your schedule for them to... Do it in to, person if you can, right? That's a yes, good of course. issue to talk in person about. Yeah, and if you express to them like, hey, I can't always pick up, you know, I can't talk to you on the phone every day, but if you leave me a message, I can respond to you by text. Like, you got to meet in the middle somewhere, But also, if you can't get them to do texts, you can at least give them like a time of day where they can call. Where like, here's our set time where we can call and you don't have to worry about getting the call out of nowhere uh, in the middle of the day, which is always what freaks me out the most as an anxious person. So you can at least get it on a schedule if you can't get them to text you. Maybe this is generational. I do not understand how a phone call where you see who's calling and can choose not to answer it is any kind of imposition. Like, just don't pick up. You know, back in my day, we didn't have caller ID. And if you didn't pick up that phone, you wouldn't know who it was. Now, you look at your phone, you see who it is, you choose not to answer. It takes maybe one second out of your life. Now, you can feel how you feel about it. And certainly, if it feels like an imposition to you, letter writer, I can understand that. But when I get phone calls in the middle of the day, which happens all the time because they are spam. I just don't answer it. And then thing resolved. But, but uh, But. another perspective here, a lot of times when it's somebody who's calling you regularly like this, if you do not pick up the first time, they're going to continue to call. That is true. That is true. And that is more stressful. Then it feels like an emergency, right? Then it's like somebody died. Yeah. That's my other big thing here of like getting a call from somebody who is calling you instead of texting you feels like somebody fucking died. So I don't like my Zoomerism of I hate phone calls. I hate that that's 
the thing, but it it is truly just how I am. And also, I expect every single person calling me to start screaming at me once the moment I pick up the phone, mm-hmm. just because that's uh, historically how it's gone. So, you know, your parents, they love you. They want to talk to you. I think you can find a good middle ground where you can communicate in a way yes. that is comfortable for all parties. Because a- as they should re- respect your perspective, you should respect theirs. They want to talk to their kids sometimes. I don't think that's unreasonable. Now, I don't know how often this person sees them in person. That's maybe part of it here. But I don't think it's an unreasonable thing to say, let's talk once a week by phone. Sure, great. Maybe do a video call. I don't know, whatever you want. But I don't think it's unreasonable to say, we'll talk once a week, otherwise it's text. That seems like a nice compromise to me. Yeah. I would be afraid to tell my parents, never talk to me on the phone. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that feels a little extreme, but I don't know. Yeah, I am perhaps not the person to ask advice no. for for this particular topic. No, and I haven't talked to my parents in like 20 years. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't really uh, text them, can you? No, that's why I, I can. They just can't text back. All right, cool. Well. <laughs> Glad I brought that up at the end there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's a very reasonable problem to have. I'd say you just got to meet in the middle. As as for the question of how do I politely tell them not to call so often, I think you politely ask and say, here's what you're willing to do. Yes. Thank you, emailer. All right. What's next? I am going to read one. Great. Hello, gamers. Hope this reaches you well. So I'm here to ask for advice on how to tolerate school. You're both Mm. so, so insanely old and decrepit, so maybe you won't remember. Starting out with some sweet talk. But high school is a shithole, and I want to know how to tolerate it. I am a junior, but feel like a freshman with how uninformed I am about my new school. I transferred from a small and mostly private alternative system to the main high school in my district. And I need to know how not to fail every class I have and how to not bang my head against the concrete repetitively in the process. Anything and everything is appreciated. Even just knowing how you folks dealt with high school would help a lot. Thanks so much. Layton, you are closer to high school than I am. I'm a little bit less decrepit than you are. Uh, I don't know if I'd say that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh? (laughs) Yes, of course. You have roughly 20 years on me, so I think... I do indeed, and I am much closer to having been in high school. Your decrepitude is, is less. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stipulate to that. Decrepitude is like up there, top words of all time. Is it even a word? I don't or think did it I is. just make it up? <laughs> Decrepidity. Decrepitude is better. Great. So yeah, I think, I'm going to think about what advice I wish I could give to my high school self, which is I really wish I had not taken it so seriously. I think maybe I wouldn't be in the position that I am today had I taken it less seriously, but I was like making myself sick with anxiety, serious about school. And I think I wish that I had done more social stuff and like being a teenager. Do you feel Mm. that way about your own high school experience? (sighs) Honestly, no. And I took high school very, very seriously, but I had a, a very good and very close friend group that I saw Quite a lot. I mean, I I went to a a private day school, which I did not live near. And so all my friends were like 45 minutes away from where I lived. But except for wishing I was like dating more, (laughs) which is something I still wish. uh, Honestly, for me, high school was not the problem. Junior high and earlier were the problem for me personally. I I know I'm not going to win any admirers with this. I had a solid high school experience. I had a good time. I was kind of finding myself for the first time. And apart from being, shall we say, unlucky in love, I had a decent high school experience. Wow. But I was also, I just worked my ass off all the time on on everything, academics, athletics. I saw friends regularly. I was just a very hard worker, as I always have been. But specifically in high school, like... I got lucky. I had good teachers, generally speaking. There were a couple bad ones, but 95% good. I feel like I'm not great uh, to give advice for how to get through high school because I had it relatively easy. One thing I will say is 
I was a member of lots of like clubs and organizations. And I think that helped like, yeah, based on the stuff I was interested in. And then you can meet people. A lot of those clubs are like, it's not just one year, right? It's all the years. And mm -hmm. you can meet people in other grades and stuff like that. And, you know, if you're part of the what, anime club or whatever it is, you know, you can just meet people with similar interests. So that might be a way to, to do it. I mean, Layton, I don't want to brag, but you're talking to the uh, president of the science club. Oh, wow. From 1992 and 1993. So. Wow. Yeah. Maybe just I, uh, treat me with some respect for once. I was the founder and president of both my high school's art club and film club. So mm. makes nice. sense. Yeah. I think aside from email or I don't know how seriously you take school, but you are a junior. So it's not like you're completely thrown into the four-year high school experience at a new place. Mm -hmm. I think that getting dropped into a big public school that you're not familiar with where things are already pretty established rough. is rough. But one of the things I wish I could impart on a teenage Layton is like, I don't know how I materially would have gotten over like shyness as I did later as an adult. But I will say that I found friends who were considerably more outgoing and extroverted than I was to a degree mm -hmm. that it scared me. And so to hang out with them, I would be dragged into situations that required a certain amount of extroversion or trying new things. So I don't know where you fall on that spectrum, but having friends that are different from you is great. And I think that mm -hmm. a lot of the like uh, self-esteem, hormone, being an awkward teenager, all that shit sucks. Yes. And it doesn't last forever and mm -hmm. it is the training ground for you to be an adult who is good at social stuff. So yeah, high school social situations are certainly not the end of the world. They are the beginning of a uh, world for you. So it's not that serious. And given that it's junior year, I mean, it feels like forever. You got two years in high school. Yeah. And you've already got a leg up on the, you know, freshies and softies. So fuck them. Yeah, make them go through what you went through. That's my one piece of advice. Treat yeah, them like shit. Yeah, that's how you make high school better. Yeah, Just right. anytime you feel bad, make other people feel bad, and then you'll do it. God, I miss wearing Uggs since I'm such a basic bitch, and I love my pumpkin spice latte and shit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as a kid, had Uggs, and this winter, I want Uggs. For people who shit on Uggs, but you've never worn Uggs, I need you to shut up, because if you put a pair on, you would understand. But mm -hmm. I was looking at, Uggs on the website and they're expensive. And there's a certain type of them that have like bows on the back mm -hmm. and they're cute. But looking at them, I was like, oh God, girls who bullied me in middle school. Oh fuck. Oh, oh, that's the shoe. Oh wow. Yeah. It was that in a North Face jacket. Oh, oh. And like an Abercrombie and Fitch t shirt that had like mm -hmm. the built in bra in it. Not good. Anyway, no. don't be a bully. Yeah. Be nice. Don't be a bully. Take care of yourself. Try new things. It's a great time to try new things. You got this. I, I hope it doesn't suck, but you can get through two years. Even if it sucks, you got it. You can get through it. Just just try to stay off social media, all right? Oh, yeah. This, this is a thing I feel like I can't give good advice on because I don't know what, you know, teenagers have to deal with on social today. But uh, if you can not be on it, you're going to be a lot happier. Yeah, I, I really think so. Except I, to follow at Layden Knight on Twitter and at Layden underscore Knight on Instagram. Of course. But yeah, I was a teenager using social media. And I think you get the feeling of any company that wouldn't want to hire me because of something that I said on social media as a teenager, somewhere I don't want to work anyway. And the reality yeah. is like, that feels like such a basic interpretation of what can be done with your information. And looking back is very naive. And I think at the time I was like, yeah, this is a good post. And it's like your brain is literally not done cooking and you don't oh. want a half formed brain, you know, spitting stuff out to come back to haunt you. It just truly is not worth it Layton, for what you get out of social media. I have posts from eight years ago when we were well into the, you know, being ninja sex party that I look at mm -hmm. and think, why, why did I put that online? Yeah. So I don't know if it's so much a 
brain cooking thing as a you're <laughs> you're, you're going to look at your past actions and be like, I don't know about that. Yeah, and it's like people can screenshot anything, mm-hmm. even if you're having like a private convert. It's just, it's not good. I can't imagine how rough it is with like Snapchat and. Oh. Ugh. One thing I will say, tell me if you disagree on this. Never send nudes. Ever. Yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. Not worth it. They don't need them. That picture lives forever. Don't do it. Yeah. And if you must, do not put your face or tattoos or anything recognizable in it. Like if you fucking have yep. to yep. and you were which you of don't. age. Which you don't. And you were of age and you don't need to. Also important. But if you have to, no face. No face, no face, no face. Don't put your face in it. Mm-hmm. All right, Good cool. Advice. Well, best great. of luck, high schooler. You're going to have a yes. great time and we both believe in you. Indeed. All right. Should I just pick one at random? Yeah, do it. Hello, I would like some gamer advice. What should I do with my ACNH island? Should it resemble a specific place? Should there be a specific area designated for something fun slash cool slash dumb? If you name it, I will try to do it. P.S. Satin Velvet fucks. With an apostrophe S and four exclamation marks, which I respect. Style points. Spaced exclamation marks. Yeah. I am interested for you not being an ACNH player to give an answer before I give my answer, because I think you have a nice outsider's perspective. I don't really know what the parameters are. Like, what can you do? So another consideration here is, I don't know if this writer has the um, Happy Home DLC, which the Happy Home DLC makes things like, it's there's so much furniture. It's like more furniture than you can possibly imagine. And if you don't have that, don't want to buy it, Nook is on, is a great website. You can meet up with other people online and trade your items, and it's really like fun and cute. I don't know if that's a thing that you're into, but it makes it so you can get a bunch of things that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. But you, you know, think of anything. I'll talk a little bit about areas that I have on my island to give you and the writer an idea. I have a city area that's like a multi-tiered. I have you know custom road patterns. I have a little supermarket. And I have a bunch of my villagers' houses in that area. So like one of them's a little outdoor movie theater. One's a cafe. I have a little like train station thing where I use the Mario warp pipes as like a metro oh, thing. Fun. And then I, mm-hmm. then I have a metro-themed room in my house. Mm-hmm. So it's like mm-hmm. a little subway station. What else do I have? I have a torture dungeon in one of my houses. That's always mm-hmm. fun. Yep. Oh, yeah. And I have a uh, cult ritual sacrifice area because they're like skeleton items and stuff. And that's fun. Mm -hmm. What I was going to say is one thing you could do is try to make it look like an existing thing. Like, I don't know, fucking village from Edward Scissorhands or some shit. I don't know. Yeah. Like pick a thing and try to emulate it. That might be a fun challenge. Yeah. Or like reenacting scenes from your favorite Mm -hmm. movies or sets Mm -hmm. that you really like. Yeah. Because you can also get into like making the outfit for your character so you can have like I remember I did a Dead by Daylight setup once where I made the little outfit and, you know, they have red lockers and they have a generator item and, you know, it really allows a lot of being creative. And also when in doubt, just do cottagecore because there are so many cottagecore type items and if you want to do something cute. So if you do any of these things, please take a picture and send it to us. Cool. Okay, Neat. great. Happy gaming. Moving on. Why don't you pick one? Oh, I want to do this one because I have an incredibly succinct answer to this. Great. That I didn't think that I would have one, but I have the perfect answer for this person. Okay. Okay. Hello, beautiful gamers. From someone who also lives with brain worms and has more knowledge of the good tech, capital G, capital T, I was wondering if you had any recommendations for higher quality and cute headphones for someone who feels like they're going to die if they have headphones on for more than a couple hours straight. The problems in particular, painful pressure, earbuds for extended periods is also bad, and hot ears. Hot ears is worse now since I yeeted my ovaries and I'm now 38 with menopause and hot flashes. Thanks, guys. I love and appreciate you. And thanks for continuing to inspire me and make me feel seen. Aw. Thank you very much. I love, much. by the way, the phrase, yeeted my ovaries. Hell yeah. Yeah. Congratulations great, on great that. Great phrase. Yeah. Bye, ovaries. All right. My answer for you, bone conduction headphones. Oh, shit. What's that? Like, as in they conduct the sound waves through bone? 
Yeah, so they are ones that when you see them on somebody, they go around the ear and the little bud sits in front of like okay. where yeah. your, your ear is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I don't know exactly how it works, but it works. And I know this because Jory has a pair that he swears by and I've tried them. And it's huh. wild. They're really good and they're like comfortable. I also have an issue with like my, you know, ears hurting because I have tiny ear canals and earbuds are too big and also hot ears with over ear ones. So I think bone conducting headphones are probably the choice for you. Interesting. And they're worth a shot. They'll definitely make your ears not be uncomfortable and you'll still be able to hear stuff. And a lot of them that's are great. headsets with microphones and everything. So that's for you. Courtesy of it. me being friends with Jory. I'm just going to say I've had a lot of luck with my AirPod Pros. And the trick is picking the right bud, you know, to actually fit in your ears. Mm -hmm. So I've had personally good luck with those. I use them all the time. Are the AirPod Pros the ones that have like the little nubbin? This is the thing that I can't yeah, stand about. Yeah, you get to ear. pick the size based on your ear size. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, because I, I also, I love my AirPods. I have the regular kind that don't have that because otherwise mm -hmm. I will, like this person, get a headache. Because like mm -hmm. the regular shape of a regular, you know, like Gen 2 or whatever AirPod mm -hmm. is perfect. They're like the best, you know, if I didn't have to deal with charging them all the time and pairing them, like I, I would use those for yeah. this podcast in a heartbeat. Like they're extremely comfortable and I forget that I have them on. Mm -hmm. So that's another option. Yeah, the pros are good because the noise cancellation is great with them. Yeah. They're not cheap, but I use them so often that they are absolutely worth the money. Yeah, and the newest generation, I'll have them on while I'm like watching movies on my iPad and I'll keep forgetting because the like, whatever it is about the track panning or the yes. atmospheric sound that they do, I always forget that I have the AirPods in. Yes. Where I'm just like, damn, this sounds so good and so like real mm -hmm. and loud. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, th I think bone conducting is the cheaper option and you don't have to deal with you know, they're usually connected by a little like hang around your neck thing. So you don't have to deal with losing an AirPod and then desperately trying to find the AirPod. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, we should read the canned responses that Google is suggesting to us <laughs> for this <laughs> message. There are three and I'll read them now. I'm so proud of you. I'll keep my ears open and glad to help. I mean, we are proud of you for eating your ovaries. Yeah. I would really like to read this very long one. Or do you want me to read it? Uh, if you could read it, that would be good. Yeah, sure. At first glance, I thought that this was too long, but I actually think this is the juiciest advice question that okay, we've gotten. Great. And there's drama. So let's do it. Howdy, gamers. Long time, first time. Okay, so here's the deal. My girlfriend and I have this friend who recently separated from her wife. Her wife was the one paying the rent, so this friend had to move out of the house. We offered to let her stay with us until she could get back on her feet. Me and my girlfriend have a second bedroom, and when we moved in together, we wanted our place to be a space where somebody could stay for a while if they needed to. So this friend moves in with us. We figured she'd be here for about a month or so before she was able to find her own place. Oh, how naive we were. We're currently coming up on month three of this person living with us. We do not live in a large apartment by any means, and things have started to get tense. Our friend has a work-from-home job where she gets to set her own hours, but it seems like she hasn't been working much. All she seems to do is sit in her room, play guitar, and sing poorly all day, like for hours without end. The same two songs over and over. <laughs> I have a lot of stories I could tell about these last few months, but to keep this fairly short and somewhat light, I'll just tell one. So our friend started seeing someone. Great, that's no problem. But one night, she decided to have her over. They couldn't go to this person's house for some reason. In the interest of being nice, me and my girlfriend said we would leave the apartment for a couple hours so they could spend some alone time together. We said we'd be home at nine. So we get home a little after nine. We bring dinner home and sit down in front of the TV to have a nice night in. About five minutes into our show, we hear our friend loudly having sex in the room next to us. So, of course, we leave again to go walk around the neighborhood a bit. Very annoyed and angry that they apparently didn't take the hint. The next day, we talked to her about boundaries and how we said we'd be home at a certain time. She got defensive and gave us a kind of non-apology apology, like she was sorry that we misread the situation. A couple of days later, she asks us if she can have this person over one day a week and if we could leave our own apartment for like three <laughs> hours so this chick can get busy in our apartment. She frames this as if it's a very reasonable request. We agree because we don't like conflict and didn't feel like arguing. I think now she expects us to do this every week. Things to keep in mind about this living situation. 
Our friend is not paying rent here. We wanted her to be able to save money so she could leave faster, but that doesn't appear to be happening. The first couple of weeks, she was good at picking up chores to do, but now that's all kind of gone out the window and she doesn't do anything. We had a talk with her the other day about when she was planning on moving out, and she said that she might be able to find a place for November, which is like way too far away. So I guess I should ask for advice at some point. How do we tell her that expecting us to leave our apartment once a week so she can have sex is completely (laughs) fucked? How do we tell her that she has far outstayed her welcome? My girlfriend says she doesn't want to ruin the friendship, but I think that ship has sailed. Any advice or wisdom or even jokes y'all could offer would be much appreciated. We feel like we're going insane over here. Anyway, thanks for reading. Love the show. Love you guys. Have a good one. Wow. Isn't that juicy? (laughs) This rules. The problem is that it doesn't rule and this sounds like hell. <laughs> no, that, that's what I mean. It rules as this is like an amazing situation to encounter uh, in real life. W- what to say here? This person is taking extreme advantage of you. And, and the fact that you two are conflict avoidant is, is making like it the, worse. the perfect storm for this person to continue taking that's advantage right. of you. So it's a tough situation. And the only way out of it, because look, it may resolve itself, but it's not going to do as soon as you wanted. You have to have a drop dead date and not, not, yeah. you know, not that she should you need drop to be dead, like 30 days. That's it. Yep. By this date, and then you, you got to move out. out. And there, there's no two ways about it. You just have to say it, especially if it's been like this long. She's not doing chores. She's not paying rent. No. No, absolutely oh, not. Oh, and is like, playing guitar and making you leave the house for three hours so she so can she have can sex, fuck. but then doesn't yeah. have sex until you are back? That's nuts. That's crazy. That is nuts. Like, if she needs time to build up to the sex, build that in. Like, I don't know, go out to dinner first or, <laughs> or something. Or go to the other person's place. God, yes, I would be indeed. horrified if I was seeing somebody and I was staying with friends because I didn't have a oh, place yeah. that I wasn't pay- paying rent for. Not only would I be horrified to regularly be bringing somebody back, but to make them leave. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I know it, it's hard to do, but you just have to set a date and, you know, oh, I might move out in November. She's going to be there for the rest of the year. Yeah. You know, this person is just taking advantage I'm not saying it's done maliciously because it's probably not, but it seems like this is the kind of person who took a little, realized there was no resistance, took a little more, no resistance, took a little more, and then keeps going on and is now entitled, feels entitled, I should say, to these crazy demands. And I think based on everything in this email, there is a very good chance that this person is not going to take it well. Uh, and it's yes. going to make things really uncomfortable at home. But every time it's uncomfortable with this person and you're dealing with the frustrating conflict, remember that after you've dealt with the conflict, think of how calm and nice your home, your safe space is going to be after this person is gone. You'll have peace and quiet. You'll get to hang yeah. out with your girlfriend in peace. You don't have to hear people fucking other than you. You don't have to hear guitar. And you won't have somebody else contributing to mess without doing chores. Like, think yeah. about how great that's going to be once this person is gone. Let, let me propose something you could say, maybe. Little white lie. Hey, our landlord found out that someone else is living here. And unfortunately, you know, they're not okay with that. You then run the risk of this person talking to the landlord. So do you want to tell a lie? I don't know. But you could say, hey, we're going against the rules. We need you out. I'm of two minds about that because once you start telling a lie like that, you could, they can yeah. push back and say, oh, I talked to the blah, blah, blah. And they said, you know, they, that's a dangerous situation. I think never lie unless you have to. And this is a thing I've had to learn the hard that way. That is very of, true. Yes. If you feel the need to lie to take more agency off of yourself when you're confronting somebody, you are actually not going to get the benefit and the experience that is of true. That is very dealing true. With, with conflict in a way that, works for you, like the only way that you get better at dealing with it and stop being conflict avoidant is by diving into it, not lying, not trying to smooth it over. You just have to be direct and like fair uh, yes. and not let it get too emotional. And and then after that, like this is always how it is for like the hardest shit that I experience in my life, you know, throughout my life, you do feel like you have matured afterwards. Like Mm -hmm. the more it sucks, the more you feel like you matured as a person. You know, it's an old maxim. Don't put off hard conversations. Certainly 
I put yeah. off hard conversations. Every time I put off a hard conversation, I wish I hadn't put it off. Every yeah. single time. So bite the bullet. Do this as soon as you can. Do it in person. Oh, yes. Do it in a way where like you can get some space from each other where you're not going to be stuck in the same room for the next whatever. Just like make sure everybody's in a pretty even keel mood that you're coming at it. You can do this and you can get your peace back. I do agree that the ship has sailed on not ruining the friendship, I think. Yeah, this other person like fucked up basically. Yeah, it really shows you like that is not stuff that a friend does. And I think especially with how I imagine this person is going to react. Like, I don't want to scare you about it, but there is no indication that this person is going to take this normally. And if you want to be nice, which I don't think you need to do, you could be like, hey, we can help you find a new place. Or if you need help moving no, some no, stuff no, no. out. No, 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 Don't do that. I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on that. Don't offer to help right. this person find a All new right. place. You've, you've done enough. You, you don't need to help them with that. All right. No, you're right. You're right. You could maybe offer to bring some boxes downstairs if you're upstairs or something like that. But yeah, that's the most. Offer to help them move, maybe. I don't know. But finding a new place sucks. It's hard. That's why this person hasn't done it. It's fucking mm-hmm. hard. So, yeah. Yeah. I also, I think there is, depending on where you live, like, and it's been three months, I don't know how many days they've been there, but there are certain places where like laws can be involved where like they essentially have squatters rights. Yeah. Uh, So I would check into that and especially make it so that, you know, the notice to get the fuck out does not, you know, put them in a position where they can hold it over you or something. Mm -hmm. Best of luck. That is tough. The situation sucks. But I, I think that you will work it out and you will go back to having peace and quiet and not having to hear somebody else fucking play guitar badly. As if one of those wasn't bad enough. Yeah. Both. Ugh. Okay, great. I have one here I'm reading. Okay. Hey, lovelies. This is name redacted. I need your advice. My friend, who I guess we can call Jory Griffiths, last name isn't important, but just to build this fictional character, is a dear friend who I've known for a long time, but recently Jory has been hard to set up any plans with. Jory takes some time to respond, and when he does, they plan a time to go out, but always cancel the day of. I don't want to be a bother and constantly ask for Jory's free time, but I also don't want to lose contact with him. What would both of you recommend as the best way to handle this situation with Jory? And I look forward to possibly hearing your What's Poppin' theme song for the first time on this new episode. Google's automated responses are, I'm fine with whatever, I'm down for whatever, and I know. Exclamation mark. I know. Well, this is a tough thing that I think everybody runs into at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And I think if it weren't for one thing about this, my advice would be different. But if you've repeatedly set up plans with this person and every time they've canceled... I would question how much do you want to keep putting into this? Like yes. it's one thing if they cancel once, but if they cancel every time and day of, that just sucks. It sucks. I hate that. Me and close friends, we are perfectly fine canceling on each other because sure. we both acknowledge we want to stay home and it's like I'm just not feeling it today. I will see you tomorrow or something. Like I fucking did that this weekend. Yeah, if you know the person, it's not a big deal. Yeah, if you're good friends and you know that you do want to hang out with each other, you know, you get your rain check and it's fine. But if it's somebody that you have been are really like consistently putting you off, if they wanted to, they would. And it's like disrespectful to you and your time and energy. Like if you're going to cancel, at least do it with like 24 hours notice, not the day up. Like you have shit to do. Your time is important. Yeah. Like it sounds like they might just not want to hang out with you. And that's dumb. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Okay. I think it's possible that this person, Jory, uh, might genuinely want to hang out, but is just a total flake. And True, 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 true. I had a friend like this. She was a good friend in many respects, but every time I would try to make plans, like, you know, for the weekend, she'd be like, oh, I don't know, let's see what happens. And it was not a dating thing. It's just a, you know, 
hanging out right. kind of friend. And every single time, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. And this person and I stayed in touch for many years and she's a genuinely good friend. She was just a total flake with this particular kind of thing. And yeah. this is one of those things, I think, that this person isn't going to change. Okay. So you just have to either be okay with it or not be okay with it. And you get to make a decision if you are or if you're not. And if you're not, then you stop trying. And if you are, then you just know that this is the way it's always going to be with this person. That doesn't make it good. But when someone sets up a pattern like this, I mean, unless you you could gently say, hey, please don't do this, you get <laughs> one, maybe two of those. And then if they're not going to change, they're not going to change. And then you have to decide how important that friendship is to you. Yeah, I appreciate your your devil's advocate side here. I just, I think maybe I've been in the position of trying too hard with people who clearly are like not here for it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. obviously, writer, you know, you're the one who has a friendship with Jory, so you know the situation better than we do. But I think maybe I'm at a point where I, oh, if you cancel on me day of multiple times... Oh. That sucks. That Especially sucks. for LA reasons like traffic seems bad today. Oh, Traffic's to always fucking side. bad today. It's LA. Calm down. No. Yeah. And it sucks to feel like somebody's continually setting you up and passing you over. You know, if anything, maybe like make it frictionless for them if you really, really want to see them. And then if they fuck up the frictionless plan, like, I don't know, let's get on a Discord call or... I will come to you, then, you know. Yeah, I, I, this is a real pet peeve of mine. I fucking hate it when people do this. And honestly, the people I am still in touch with don't do this, which is why I'm still in touch with them. Yeah. Yeah, so frustrating. There, I really feel your pain on this. There are plenty of people who I know okay and have wanted to become closer with and who have also expressed, like, wanting to, you know, get to know each other better and then... They just consistently do this shit. And it's like, man, mm -hmm. this is not good. <laughs> or you know, you know what I like is the, hey, let's hang out. Yes, let's hang out. Okay. How about date? No, no response. response. If you don't literally schedule the thing after saying yes, let's hang out, it's not gonna happen. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. It's the <laughs> headphone cord. The headphone cord touched her and she didn't like it. Yeah, well, that happens. You know, spontaneity is great. Hey, let's hang out. You're free now. I'm in your neighborhood. Yeah, great. Fun. Let's do it. But the scheduled thing that gets canceled day of, especially because I like moved shit around to make this happen. Yeah. You know, I'm taking time away from my wife and child to hang out with your ass. And now you're <laughs> going to cancel on me at the last minute. I move shit around. Like, don't, don't. It really pisses me off. I hate that. Yeah. Best of luck with Jory. Yeah. To us all. To us all. All right, uh, let's do a couple more of these. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them. By the way, got a lot of responses to this, like way did, more than I thought. Very so thank you. Thank you to everybody. Let's do this one. Sup, nerds. So have you ever been in the situation where you're very much annoyed by a best friend's significant other, like fiance level? They aren't a bad person. I just particularly find their behavior and personality irksome. I feel guilty too. I just don't think we mesh. Epic gamers sure have it rough. Layden? This one's tough. It is tough because what do you do? Um, I will say, with the benefit of my decrepitude <laughs> in advanced age, most of the time I have found a significant other to be terrible. That couple has not lasted. Uh, now that's harder to say on on short time scales that someone in their twenties might might have experienced, but I'm in my late forties. Friends have been through divorces and remarriages and all that stuff, and a lot of times when it seemed like there was something off, guess what? There was something off. So it does not answer the question, except to say that you might be right on the money here. <laughs> what do you do? Unfortunately, I don't think you can do anything. I mean, if you're going to pull the trigger on, hey, your partner sucks conversation and not even su like sucks is different than, hey, they're kind of annoying, which seems like the situation we're dealing with here. I don't think you can do anything about that. 
Like, yeah, you just have to put up with it. Unless they explicitly come to you saying like, what's your vibe check on this? Or I think I've had more experience right. with the thing that I'm about to say is that like, not only do they suck, it seems like they're actively harmful to your friend. Right. Like it's an abusive relationship or something. Like I've right. been on that side and that sucks to experience, but that's the time where like, you know, there are a bunch of complicated things about trying to intervene, but that is when you would want to be like, hey, can we talk about this? But if it's just they're annoying, <laughs> like in a benign way, I think practically... Don't do anything. You can have hangs with your friend one-on-one -on -one without the partner, or you're at like a big group thing, and then you don't have to explicitly, you know, hang out with the partner. But yeah, I, I truly do think that kind of thing, eventually the friend does see the light if the person is just annoying. <laughs> yes. You're, you're kind of stuck here. I hate to say yeah. it. Just got to deal with it. And you know what? Think of it kind of like going to work, right? You go to work. Most of the people at work, you're going to be like, well, eh, okay. Kind of annoying. We don't really mesh. We're not close friends. You might find a couple people who you're like really get on with. That's kind of the situation you're in. Like you show up to work, which is hanging out with your friend and their partner. Mm -hmm. And okay, well, person isn't particularly to your tastes most of the time. I think you just have to, you know, put up with it. Unfortunately. And if the person, you know, looking at it from a steel manning point of view, like if this person makes your friend happy, like maybe you can try to approach interactions with them by... I don't know, finding some sort of common ground. I'm thinking about doing this and I'm exhausted by it. So, yes, <laughs> it's the kind of person there are some, and they're not, I don't have many people like this in my life anymore. There are some people who I find so desperately annoying that the moment they walk into a room, I can't make eye contact with them because <laughs> it's like if I look at you wrong, I'm going to get mad and I'm going to have to leave. <laughs> So, and these are all like friends of friends kind of people. You can pick, right? pick them out, their voice out from above the oh. din and it's like, oh. Oh my God. Yes. And you're like, why? Why are you friends with that person? <laughs> right? They're so annoying. Who knows? Uh, it's probably something that you don't see or whatever, you know, who knows? But we all have these people who come into our lives that we see occasionally, but we're just like, oh my God, no, please, no. And that is... That is life. Yeah, I'm thinking about this in the present tense. And I'm thinking about like over the past couple of years, like those ancillary people who are annoying. They're not people that I have to be around anymore because the primary person who mm -hmm. was bringing them in realized that they suck. So, yep. Which is honestly what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, if they're a long term romantic partner, they get married, whatever. I don't know. Like, that's a different situation. But. Is this even good advice? Are we giving good advice? On this our, 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 our advice is you're not going to change a situation. So you just, just got to put up deal with it. With it. I, th yeah. I think that's fine advice in this case. Nothing toxic. It seems like is happening. This is just no. kind of annoying. A person that the letter writer finds annoying, you know, too bad. <laughs> it's unfortunately my advice. Yeah. There, there's nothing else you can do. Are you familiar with the phrase bitch eating crackers? Uh, no, I am not. Bitch eating crackers is like, somebody who annoys you so much that they could just be eating crackers and you'd be like, that fucking bitch. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's nothing you can actually do about a bitch eating crackers because the bad ending is you let the annoyance boil over and then you have some sort of confrontation with them, which nobody wants. Nobody wants that. So you just gotta, you just gotta suck it up and deal with it. I want to read uh, one more because this is one where I do have advice. Can you read the, the physics one, Layden? Dearest Leighton and Brian, Brian's name is spelled wrong. That's fine. It's fine. It happens. I need some advice. I am a physics student at a university with a very competitive engineering school. Physics is in the engineering school here. I've already been here a whole year and did well in my classes, but I can't shake the feeling that everyone around me is way smarter and more capable than me. I've talked it through with many people, and I know that it's mostly just me being self-conscious, but every few weeks I get all worked up about how I don't feel like I'm smart enough to be enrolled here. 
Given Brian's background, I know he likely has some insight, but I would love to hear what both of y'all have to say about the feeling of not fitting in when it comes to competitive school slash work environments. P.S. Love the show. Okay. Well, of course, there's a name for this. It's called imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And if it makes you feel any better, letter writer, this is something I felt literally every day (laughs) as, as a physicist. And the main thing I want to say is that most people, I don't want to say basically everybody, but it might be that the vast majority of people feel this way. And the ones that don't, I have a little pet term for those type of people. Those people are called assholes. <laughs> and th- there's being confident in your abilities, which is great. Everyone I know that never felt like they, you know, oh, maybe, you know, that, that person's probably better at physics than me. All of those people were monsters. <laughs> um, and generally, if you have any kind of reasonable perspective on yourself, you're going to feel this way at least some of the time, hopefully not most, but at least some of the time I felt this way pretty much all the time. And I just want you to know that this is a very normal thing to feel. And like you say in the letter does not reflect your actual ability with physics or anything else. So what do you do about it? I mean, one thing is just once you're in that environment enough, you'll find the people that make you feel good about yourself. This is something that I really struggled with in in physics is I would work with people occasionally who just made me feel stupid, not because they were better at physics than me or not only because, but because it was just an attitude thing. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to work with those people. I'm not going to talk to those. I'm not going to hang out with them. I'm going to hang out with the people who are affirming and generous. Yeah. And who you feel like you can have a mutual relationship with. Yeah. That you make them feel good about themselves. They make you feel good about themselves. Because I know exactly what you're talking about with somebody who makes you feel dumb in a professional environment like that, where you're already having imposter syndrome and they're just, their ego is so huge that it takes up all the air in the room. And even though you like rationally know that they suck, you feel worse and you look at that person and think, I wish I could give you some of my imposter syndrome because you deserve yes. it like a well, little bit. Because a, a lot of times that confidence leads to success, at least initially, yeah. right? And, you know, they come in all blustery, talking a big game, dick swinging, et cetera. And, and people see that. And sometimes people are like, oh, yeah, that's that. That person's really good. Rest assured that most of the time, unless they can actually back that up, they won't last very long. Yeah. And it also, to people with experience, you can like smell the insecurity on a person who's overconfident and like that. But it takes some time. It takes having known a couple of those people and probably getting burned by a couple of those people. But like then once you know how to spot it, it's just like, oh, Jesus. But I also want to say that I run into this all the time of thinking that my imposter syndrome is something I need and that left unchecked, I would become that guy. Like, oh, if I don't have this imposter syndrome and if I'm not shitty to myself about this, then I'm going to, you know, be a horrible person. And I'm also not going to do work that's as good. Like, that's not how it works. No. I don't know a single successful person who does not deal with imposter syndrome to some degree. And I think- it correlates with the more successful you are, the more you feel like a fraud. <laughs> yeah. By the way, once you, uh, as we've talked about, once you have a big success and you're like, I'm never going to do that again. Fuck. Yeah, that was so, a fluke. Yeah. You have imposter syndrome. I have imposter syndrome. Yeah. It's very pervasive and it sucks. It helps when you have friends who also deal with it. And hearing a friend be like, oh, I'm a pile of shit. And you look at them and you feel that unadulterated no, you're not. You're so good at what you do and realize that your friends feel that same surge of emotion about you. Yeah. Can help a lot. Yep. One of the surest signs of maturity I ever found in in physics was the older scientist who would ask maybe the most basic question imaginable at a seminar. And <laughs> do you know what nobody ever thought man, that person's dumb. Like what everybody thought was, A, is there something subtle here I'm missing? Or B, this is hard. Like it's okay to ask basic questions, you know? 
it's okay to ask simple questions with simple answers. And anyone who makes you feel stupid for doing that is missing the point because physics is hard. Even the smartest people in the world, the best physicists in the world will tell you this shit is hard and we're constantly struggling to understand it. All throughout my career as a scientist, some of my, all, I should say, of my most important work came from a, wait a minute, do I actually understand that? Like, maybe I should just take a step back and question the assumptions. Maybe there's something interesting here that comes from reevaluating. And that all started with, hey, is this actually right? So don't get down on yourself for not understanding simple things is something else I want to say, because sometimes those simple things aren't so simple. And being curious will add more value to your life than a need to look smart and will take you further and bring better experiences to your life and help you build that confidence. Because if you're curious and you follow through on it, you will usually get good results from that. And uh, it sounds like you've got a good head on your shoulders, Ryder. I wish you the best of luck. Yeah. Keep learning physics. And just know that everybody, everybody feels like a fraud. Yeah, that's true. But that doesn't diminish your own unique experience with feeling like a fraud because everybody experiences it differently. So, yeah. yeah. Also, if you want to feel smart, talk to an engineering student. Boom. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Nailed. Got him. Thank you, everybody who emailed us. Wow. You took the time to write in and say some stuff so we could read it on a show. Very much appreciated. I hope we said at least one helpful thing and not a bunch of um, ploviating bullshit. Am I using bloviating correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Someone sent a question that we did not have time to answer, but it was about their dog and it included a picture of their dog. And the dog's name is Nova and Nova is incredibly cute. So I'm sorry we didn't answer your question, but I just feel the need to say your dog is cute. And next time we do advice, uh, also send us pictures of your dogs. Because why not? Layton, we're moving on to our first segment now. Mm -hmm. This is our pop culture recommendation segment. We get to talk about some culture we've been enjoying recently. It could be a book, a movie, a video game, anything you like. The name of the segment is What's Pop, and then the theme song goes here. What's poppin'? What's poppin'? So I ask you, Leighton Gray, what's poppin'? What's poppin' for me is maybe my most deeply inaccessible pop Ooh, like in the that. history of the show. But also, let me put it this way. It's something that I watched and adored and intensely recommended to like three people And knowing that those three people are going to lose their minds for it and anyone else is not going to be into it. Mm -hmm. So what it is, is a movie directed by Damon Packard called Reflections of Evil. Okay. I've taken a dive into Damon Packard's filmography after this movie. It's one of the craziest movies I've ever watched. You can watch it on archive.org. But it was shot... Guerrilla style in Los Angeles in 1999 to like 2001. Mm. And I'm not sure I could even tell you what the plot of this movie is because it's more of a vague suggestion. Mm -hmm. A guy who is played by the director, Damon Packard, wanders around Los Angeles selling watches and a bunch of crazy shit happens. Like, I watched this with Jory, and both of us were laughing hysterically the entire time, but it also has, like, great horror imagery in it. There's, like, a ton of vomit. It is unlike anything else I've ever watched. You can feel that this is probably Tim and Eric and Eric Andre's favorite movie. Like, it feels so ahead (laughs) Uh of its time in a lot of the things that it's doing. It sort of feels like Neil Breen, if Neil Breen was good at making movies, or... Mm -hmm. This is what I was talking about with Jory, is that it feels Lynchian in the way that Lynch has this obsession with, like, weird-looking old people and, like, Garmin Bosia and the tiny people at the end of Mulholland Drive. Like, that type of Lynchian is very much how this movie feels. Mm -hmm. And I cannot stop thinking about it. There's a behind-the-scenes documentary on it, and the director is just, like, a fascinating 
person because he was homeless in Los Angeles for like 20 years making short films. Oh. And then he had a relative die and leave him an inheritance of $500,000. And then he spent all that money making this movie. And cool. It's incredible. There are maybe like three people listening to this who would actually enjoy it because in practice, it is like an obnoxious, overwhelming assault on the senses. But the climax of the movie is shot at Universal Studios Hollywood. Oh, hell yes. <laughs> and, he, and he got banned for life. And That's what they awesome. pull off is amazing. <laughs> so Reflections it. of Evil, I had found it because I kept running into it on Letterboxd and I was shocked at how like for a movie I had never heard of across the board, everyone was like, this is the best movie I've ever seen in my life. So mm -hmm. there's a very particular type of person that this will resonate with. And I loved it. I'm probably going to watch it again soon. I just, I fucking adored it. Cool. Brian, what's happened for you? I'm going to pick a classic. It's the opposite of what you just said. We watched Galaxy Quest with Audrey this weekend. Oh, wow. And Great nine-year-old movie. Galaxy Quest rules. It is so good. I love it so much. Everyone here knows Galaxy Quest. I think if you don't, like, I think it is one of the great comedies of the last 25-ish years. It's basically Star Trek, you know, with sort of a meta angle. Amazing character actors in it. Enrico Colantoni, Missy Pyle, Tony Shalhoub, Sam Rockwell, like the cast, Alan Rickman, of course, like yeah, just Alan a bunch of, the best part of the Alan Rickman's the best, Sigourney Weaver. It's just an awesome cast and it's really smart and funny. It works as a kid. It works as an adult. It works as a Star Trek fan. It works as not a Star Trek fan. It just never stops being awesome. I love that movie. Always happy to watch it. And Audrey really, really loved it too. Aww, so I'm so glad. Yeah, it's such, it's so fun. And she has no context. Like she hasn't seen a couple Star Trek things, but nothing really. So yeah, Galaxy Quest. It's, you know, 25-ish years old now. It's 1999. Great. Yeah. Is this an overstatement? Maybe the best sci-fi comedy ever? I think it's probably not far from it. I mean, what are the contenders for that? Spaceballs? Yeah, which doesn't even come which close. Which we both, yeah, we doesn't both share similar feelings on. Yeah, there's probably other ones in there that I'm forgetting, but it's uh, yeah, it's so good. Yeah, so that's what's popping for me. I love Galaxy. That's a very good poppin'. Yeah. All right, cool. Time for our final segment. It's three parts gratitude exercise, one part petty grousing, and the theme song goes right here. It's called Peaches and Lemons. I forgot that part. Peaches and Lemons. I'll do lemons first. My lemon is that I was looking at pictures of myself from a few years ago mm -hmm. and I realized that I have not like box dyed my hair in a while. What does that mean? I mean like buying a box of <laughs> oh, dye. Oh, like a box of the, dye. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Because my go-to with that is like really light platinum blonde and my hair looks bad. So I was like, I'll do that and I'll enjoy it. What is your natural hair color? According to my driver's license, Sandy. Does that mean like brownish blonde? Yeah, it's like blondy brown, like blonde highlights. I was like a yeah. platinum blonde child and then it right, just got right. browner over time. But I got a box and I was really excited about it. And I put it on and I waited and I did the whole thing and I was very thorough. Uh, and my hair looks the fucking same. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh... That's really funny. And box dyes. I'm sorry. I bought two boxes of it because I was like, oh, I have so much hair. I'll probably need the second box. Mm -hmm. And I guess I could do it again. There's like a slight difference if you hold like one strand up to the light. It feels like I dyed my hair with my actual hair color. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's fucking annoying because, like, you got to keep it on your head and it smells bad and your scalp itches and your hair, like, feels weird for a cut. Like, you know, it does damage to your hair to dye it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my lemon. What about you? Cool. My lemon is, I believe I have reached the point in my life where I need reading glasses and it's, it's annoying. I knew it was coming. And it's just irritating to deal with. So now I got to get fucking readers because I'm like, I noticed I was reading fewer books. And I was like, why? And I'm like, oh, I hate reading now because it's hard to see the words. So, Oh, yeah. do you wear reading glasses on top of contacts? I should. Yeah. 
So what it's, style of readers are you going to get? Well, that's a good question. I don't know yet. So I get to pick. Are you going to get like librarian chains? No. The sides of it? No. I'm not going to do you that. You should. I don't want a chain. I don't know. But if you have style suggestions, Leighton, I'm sure I would be all yours. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what would be good for you. I feel like brown frames would really work for you. Like, I think a hard black is not. That's what I used to wear. You know, hard I think black. it is very hard to make those work for a lot of people. And I think that, like, maybe a tortoise shell for you would be fun. Mm-hmm. I did have something like that for a while. I think that you have the face to pull off like some crazy ones, which I don't think you personally would want to do. But I think you're in the rare position of if you wanted to go really bold with it, you could. I could. And I'm very jealous of that because I can't pull that off. I mean, you have like round glasses, right? Is that right? Yeah, pretty much the only ones that I think actively look good are my like wire round ones and the only ones I like wearing. And I think those would not really work for you. Well, uh, I'm going to try some options. Rachel also is in the same situation and tried a bunch of weird ones. And the, and Rachel could easily pull off like a cute retro cat eye type. 100%. Glass. Rachel looks, here's the thing about Rachel. When the glasses are right, she looks so fucking cute in glasses. And she tried a bunch that didn't quite work, but there are some glasses where I'm like, that's the greatest thing ever. It looks really good on her. So it's been fun watching her experiment with readers as well. That's so cute. You too with your readers. Yeah, you know, I'm pushing 50 and it's about time. So there we are. Nice. Now you just need to like fall asleep sitting up with the newspaper on your lap and your, oh, yeah. your readers right. at the tip of your nose. Yep. What do they call them? The little pince, pince nez? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The, like really, really tiny ones. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll do a monocle. That'd be sick. I think you could rock a monocle. I'm sure I could. I'd be good at it. Anyway, peaches. Now it's time for peaches. We each do three yes. peaches, which are things that are cool and good. I will go. Sure. My first one is that I now have plans for Halloween night with what? Aaron and Susie and Vernon. And I don't want to say what the plans are, but they're very exciting Halloween plans. And I usually don't do anything cool on Halloween night. As opposed to every other night when you do yeah. cool stuff. Yeah. But the past couple of years, it's kind of become a tradition that Aaron and Susie and Vernon and I will go to the various horror events around town and it's so much fucking fun and we're doing a similar thing on Halloween night and I'm just I'm so fucking excited. That's great. That's my first peach. My second peach is that there's this app that I used to use that I re-downloaded because I'm trying to get my shit together and stop being such a fucking disgusting piece of shit. <laughs> I love that we just gave advice for an hour and I'm just like checking in <laughs> from self-loathing. Yeah. But It's called Habits. It's a really simple app. And I love about an app when you don't have to make an account. But it's literally just like a a gamified task list of where I put a bunch of really basic things on it. And then I feel a sense of accomplishment and mastery when I check off. Took mood stabilizer, brushed hair, made Mm -hmm. bed. Like just a bunch of really simple things. And then some like wild card ones. Like you can track an amount. So I have like words written you know, thing in there. So over time you have data and it's just a nice reminder to do stuff. So that has been really nice. And it feels silly how helpful something that has like just a bunch of basic things. It just helps, you know, my brain's fucked up. Executive dysfunction is hard and being able to press button to get serotonin is nice. And as a result of that, my third peach is I've been doing skincare again. And I have like my nice little nighttime skincare ritual. And not only is it nice, my skin looks fucking great right now. So cool. Skincare, it makes a difference. And it's just a nice little wind down activity where I'm being nice to myself, which is difficult to do. So that's great. I have these little zit stickers that are shaped like stars that are really cute. And I went to take my dog to piss yesterday and I ran Mm -hmm. into my neighbor and I was talking to my neighbor and then she was like, you look like you went to a really fun party. And I realized that I still had the zit stickers on my face and I was like, oh no, I've been in bed all day. These are for zits. (laughs) Nice. So yeah. What about you? What are your peaches? Okay. Peaches. Uh, Number one peach. I had a lovely, lovely lunch with my friend and yours, Brent Lilly. Last Aww. week, I've been trying to get it on the books for a while. He's a busy man. I'm a busy man. And we made it happen. We went to Foxy's in Glendale, which is a great old school, weird little restaurant. 
and I thought it was great. So, awesome. yeah, it, that was that was nice. Peach number two is I played the closing set of the best show, twenty four hour show, with friend of the show, Chalky the Funk Wizard, and, and it was amazing. It was so fun. He w- he asked me. So he he had been booked and he was like, hey, do you want to sit in for a few tunes? I was like, of course I want to sit in for a few tunes. And everyone there was so nice. You know, I I was nervous. Best show has been important to me for many years. And it's like, I'm showing up. I did the Trey Magnifique thing. So I was like, is this going to be the kind of thing where I show up and people are like, who the fuck is this <laughs> dude in the suit? But quite the opposite. Everybody was awesome. It was so much fun. I couldn't see the comments, but you said like, they were they were positive. Oh yeah, I sent you a bunch of them because the day that I watched Reflections of Evil with Jory was the day that you did this. But we were watching it together, and it was delightful. And the comments were very funny because there was <laughs> who was one of them. <laughs> this is the who's who of who is that. <laughs> Yeah, great. Like um, yeah, as it should be. I wasn't even a now anou- like the, the Chucky announced me and brought me up. I wasn't like an official yeah. guest or anything. Who the fuck is no, this guy? No, but course. the thing is, is every comment was like, "Wow, this guy blows!" Like on the set, or or like slay yeah. magnifique, or this is legitimately great sax and all that stuff. So that was nice to hear. Speaking of imposter syndrome, I'm very very insecure about my saxophone playing, and it was nice to get some positive feedback on that. Yeah, Despite, by the way, it. everyone I work with saying, you sound great. Do I believe them? No, I don't. <laughs> exactly. It's a vast conspiracy to convince the, you that you're good at saxophone. Yes, absolutely. Because one person once said maybe I wasn't the best saxophone player they've ever heard, and that has stuck with me. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. And my final peach is that we have scheduled here at Late Night Incorporated a live show for our 200th episode. We're just announcing it like this. Dynasty Holy Typewriter shit. on December 14th. Tickets are not available yet. We're going to book a fun guest for it, but we are going to do a live show for our 200th episode. So save the date. December 14th, 2023. I believe it's 7 p.m. We'll put tickets on sale as soon as we can, as soon as we lock down an awesome guest. We have someone who's potentially going to do it, but you know, do stay we? tuned for that ticket link. And yeah, 200th episode live show, baby. Dynasty Typewriter, December 14th. I am so excited. Same. We have not done a live show. I mean, it's hard to believe. I was looking now that my phone gives me the like four years ago. Three and a half years. Oh, it's so fucked up that this started as a stage show with like not really much of an intent of being a podcast. And we haven't done a show since it's been a podcast, which is crazy, but it's been covid yep so hopefully that means we sell more than three tickets well i want to pack this place so get people coming out please buy t- please please buy tickets my ego cannot handle the billionth random show that i've done that doesn't move tickets please yeah. it's please. gonna happen it's gonna be great we have lots of time it's gonna be the best yeah we've got to drag some late night regular camp cameos i mean we can kidnap jory and yep. vernon pretty easily and jarek yep. And Jarek gets of to be a one because yes. he hasn't, he wasn't around for uh, right. previous live shows. We just locked this down. I don't think we've even checked with Jarek yet, but we will by the time uh, he hears this. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. All right, everybody. All right, yeah. Thank you for sending in your advice and for listening to this episode. You can find more at patreon.com slash late night. Oh, huh? I forgot. I was going to do this for you the other day and I didn't have my gear set up. anyway if you wanted to hear the beginning of that there it is and nobody does do it better than except for that brian wecht blatant fuck up when i was supposed to go (laughs) but there it is no that, that was amazing that made me really happy Oh, it's so good. I I like that that it sounds like the like a Mario theme a little bit with yep. that little it'd be nice. <laughs> 
All right. Anyway, check us out at patreon.com slash late night. If you like the show, tell your friends, tell your dog, uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or in the Spotify reply thing. I realize that we don't ask people to do this, but it does genuinely really help the show if you yes. share it. And, and it makes us it, feel good. Yeah. It's all about our ego and feeding the beast that is imposter syndrome. So it stops tummy rumbling um, <laughs> for a little bit. All right. See ya. <sighs> Bye, everybody. Late and Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Night, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com. <laughs>